Welcome to another water cooler conversation and another director's cut in which I talk to some fellow think tank directors about the big issues of the day. My name's Nick Cater, Executive Director of the Mendes Research Centre. Joining me once again from Wellington, New Zealand is Oliver Hartwich from the New Zealand Initiative. Welcome, Oliver. Hello. And, uh, Good to be with you. John Roscombe from Melbourne from the IPA joins me. Welcome, John. Hello, Nick. Hello, Oliver. Yeah, hi, John. First to, uh, the, the first thing that's top of my mind at the moment is this lurch towards authoritarianism, notably in Victoria. I mean, it's been going on right through uh, this COVID epidemic, in, even in jurisdictions you didn't expect it to. But in Victoria's been the worst example. In Australia, of a, a government that's chosen to rule take all the powers it has, the emergency powers under public health legislation and use them to devastating effect to, to ban uh, public demonstrations and so forth, to, to uh, go into people's homes without a warrant, all this they've been doing. Now they're proposing, or Dan, Andrew, Dan Andrews is proposing to extend these powers in perpetuity, uh, giving him power to rule under an emergency decree for three months at a time and then extend it is this justified at this end of, of the COVID crisis? Indeed, is it ever justified for a government to abandon the normal democratic checks and balances and rule in this way? John? No, it isn't, Nick, at all. One of the many things that we will be unpacking and examining in the years and decades to come as to what's happened in Australia, what's happened in New Zealand, what's happened across the English-speaking world is how has it come to this? Um, I would argue that the governments and the media very early on in the crisis, when we didn't know what we were facing, um, supported each other. The media supported draconian arbitrary powers by the government. Uh, the government called upon the media uh, to support its policies. And now both of them are compliant and complicit in exactly, as you say, turning over notions of democracy. We've had Dan Andrews say that uh, Parliament is irrelevant, question time, uh, does nothing to fight the pandemic, he said. Parliament was suspended, protests were suspended, playgrounds uh, were locked up. Um, and we had, as we know, pregnant mothers locked, uh, handcuffed in their, in their living rooms and, and locked up for Facebook posts. Um, uh, what we have is now a continuation of a process that began 18 months ago for someone like me. Um, what I'm concerned about is that it wasn't called out early enough. The legal profession, by and large, with the exception of about a dozen brave barristers, has been silent. The human rights lobby has been silent. The media have supported the uh, world's longest lockdown. And now we have, for me, the ultimate culmination of absolute power corrupts absolutely, which is a law that is being rammed through the Victorian Parliament that will basically then allow the Premier and the Minister for Health to do anything. Uh, and it is alarming that as yet the federal government, with one or two exceptions, hasn't spoken up. The media has supported the law because for them to not support the law would be to call out the fact that they have enabled this from the very beginning. Oliver, how does it look from your perspective? I mean, you've, you've, you've not been without authoritarian measures in New Zealand, have you? But uh, how, how, how does it look in New Zealand and how does the Victorian situation seem from your perspective? Well, as I was just listening to John, I thought he was talking about New Zealand. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe 10, 20 percent more, a bit more extreme even than New Zealand, but actually very similar to what we have experienced What's actually really worrying me at the moment is actually that this government doesn't seem to have a way out of it. They're confusing the hell out of us, um, and especially Aucklanders. I mean, Auckland has been locked down now for, I think, 11 or 12 weeks, and the government just last week announced a traffic light system to replace the old alert level system. But the whole thing has been so complicated now. So I don't know how many different levels of alert we now have, how many different measures there are, how many different targets there are. And Aucklanders have no idea whether they will be allowed to leave their city before Christmas to go on some kind of summer holiday. Whether it's going to be a normal summer for New Zealand, well, we'll see. But it, it's, it's actually robbing people in New Zealand, it's robbing businesses the ability to even plan ahead. 
you can't even tell you what's going to happen in a week or two, let alone in a month or two. So this is actually uh, detrimental to the business community here and to ordinary people's lives and their mental sanity. Apart from that, what John described about um, Australia is happening here too. We had Parliament suspended for a time um, of this lockdown. Prime Minister said actually it wasn't necessary for Parliament to sit. It wasn't necessary really to have an epidemic response committee that we had in the lockdown last year, which worked really well. So actually Parliament has not been able to keep government to account. The media, same story here, um, probably has got something to do with the fact that uh, the New Zealand government provides $55 million to support the media in this difficult time. And guess what the outcome is? There's relatively little critical media coverage of the government, although with people getting increasingly frustrated about the state of the country, that at least is slowly changing. So the media are finally waking up. I don't know about you guys, but I've learned a lot, I think, about, about human nature and, um, you know, the fragility. Jordan Peterson talks about this, the fragility of, of our societal structures through this. Um, just, you know, we, we, we thought we had a very robust liberal democracy in Australia that, the, you know, the concepts of freedom, freedom of speech well understood the idea that uh, you know governments work best when uh, they have oppositions that are strong that can challenge and test ideas and parliaments that can can act as chambers of review and and so on and so forth uh, I thought that's where we were but of course that's collapsed so quickly uh, and uh, dis but without it's the lack of concern or apparent lack of concern I mean the age newspaper for instance last week John didn't seem to barely want to cover this story at all and yet no recognition that, that we've lost something very important when we start moving the way we're governed away from the parliamentary system. Do, do you think that's right? Well, look, yeah, I do and I'd be interested in Nick's view, uh, Nick and uh, Oliver, your views on this, but my view is um, I've been shocked by a couple of things. Shocked, worried, alarmed... Uh, uh, various adjectives I could use. Um, for us in the uh, free market uh, space of uh, liberal democratic think tanks, we tend to think um, that an aspiration for freedom well, is, is a natural it? human it condition. I think, well, 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 Nick and Oliver, I would have thought so till 18 months ago, quite, quite seriously. Um, we, we pre the IPA, and I'm sure we all do in, in this space, we premise our work um, on a preference of individuals and families and businesses to be free to make their own decisions. Um, I think we've seen, certainly in Australia, uh, that assumption overturned. But what we're now unpacking, and you put your finger on it, is a bigger assumption um, that our liberal democracy was in some way secure, that Parliament would always uh, have an oversight over the actions of the executive, that judicial review would always have a role. And I'll tell you what we've seen in Australia. We've seen the courts uh, endorsing what governments have done. We have seen the professional uh, class endorsing what governments have done. We've seen um, the media unquestioningly uh, follow uh, the powers of the executive and the state. Um, this idea that certainly... Australia and New Zealand are, are free countries um, based around the rule of law, based around limited government, has been overturned. And it's revealed the how fragile our systems are, that in 18 months they could be ripped asunder. This is a, this is a big, big question for, for all of us. I totally um, agree with and, you. And, you know, as uh, the, the line about, it, about how you go broke, uh, you, go slow, you go broke slowly, then quickly... Um, what's happened here is we've lost our freedoms quickly and then even more quickly. Yeah, no, I, I, I Sorry, was just going to say, I completely agree with you. And it's not just COVID, by the way. Mm. We've had a discussion in the office last week. Yeah. I'm not sure whether you're following New Zealand politics at all. Our government is now embarking on the so-called free waters reforms. The idea is that the government in Wellington wants to confiscate waterworks from New Zealand councils the waterworks that ratepayers have paid for over decades, worth about $50 billion, and central government in Wellington wants to basically confiscate that and put it into new entities. Now, this is totally anti-democratic. The councils are against it. The majority of people are against it, and government's going to do it anyway. 
So we had a discussion in the office and some of us said, well, actually, maybe this shows the need for a constitution because that's the difference between Australia and New Zealand. We don't have a written constitution. But actually, we came to the conclusion after a short discussion that a constitution is almost pointless mm. because mm. a constitution might slow down yeah. things, but it doesn't replace a constitutional spirit. And yeah. there is none of that in New Zealand. Correct. There is no constitutional spirit and you can see it every day. So you can see it in the arrogance by which this government now confiscate stuff from councils. You can see it in retrospective legislation that we're talking about these days. You can see it in all sorts of other arrogant moves by this government. For example, until last week, they were considering whether they shouldn't just postpone next year's local government elections under the pretense of COVID. I mean, I don't know whether in September next year this is still an issue, but anyway, the government wanted to give itself the power to just postpone elections if it didn't want them, probably because of the water reforms. So we've got this problem here that there is no constitutional spirit actually changing any of that. The problem is, look at our institutional framework. We thought we had a good one. We thought we had an independent central bank focused on price stability. Yeah. We thought we had a public finance act, actually keeping government honest when it comes to spending and taxation decisions. So we had all of these institutions. We had an independent uh, civil service, a public service, based on a Westminster model of um, how a Westminster style democracy and public service should run. Mm -hmm. None of this is a guarantee that this will actually continue to work if there is no public understanding that these are good institutions that are worth preserving. And even with the constitution, you can't, can't preserve them if the public don't get it. If the public doesn't understand what it's for and why this is important to keep. Constitution. Let's talk about constitutions. We've got one. We've got one only because we're a federation. I think if we hadn't become a federation, we, we wouldn't have felt the need for one. Um, and written, written documents of that sort, I mean, it's worth noting that Victoria is the only state in Australia that has, a, I think it's called a Charter of Rights or Charter of Human Rights, John, or something like that. And yet, you know, setting That's out what right, the, Nick, the rights yes. of individuals right. are against, you know, the, the, the overbearing state. Well, you know, that's, that's pretty, proved to be pretty useless in the last few, few uh, 18 months or so. But look, so the Constitution sets out not, not with absolute clarity, right, John? I mean, there's, a, there's lots of, of areas, of grey areas, if you like, within the Constitution, who's responsible for what. But instinctively, I think we all want some leadership from the federal government towards what's happening in Victoria, to be saying, you know, Amanda Stoker, the, the Assistant Attorney General, has, has, has spoken out on this. We'd like to see more of this. So my question is, John, number one, what constitutional powers does this, the... the the Commonwealth have to overrule this? And secondly, you know, Oliver talked about the spirit of the Constitution. What can we do in the spirit of federation, in the spirit of a federated uh, country to influence events from outside in Victoria? Oh, Nick, I reckon that's a key question. Um, and it goes to what Oliver was talking about. I've been delving back into Edmund Burke. I think uh, those of us on the centre-right uh, have always understood uh, that words, that constitutions, that laws and regulations have to be um, supported by custom, convention, uh, that what, how we live um, has to be based on a common understanding. And in Australia, we've seen the High Court basically throw out uh, any accepted concept of Section 92 and the idea that trade between the states shall be free uh, and that borders shall by and large be open. Um, exactly as you said, Nick, here in Victoria, we have the Charter of Human Rights. It's meant to guarantee our basic freedoms. It didn't stop the Victorian government locking up without notice for days um, public housing tenants. Uh, and the ombudsman uh, did an inquiry in, into that, said basically the Charter... Uh, was completely ignored and no one batted an eyelid. I think uh, there's certainly legal measures the, the federal government could take in relation to Victoria around uh, things such as funding. Federal funding for Victorian activities can certainly um, be uh, connected and, and restricted um, to various things. Um, but more important than that is moral suasion. Um, we have lost the debate around a moral uh, 
argument and so for the Prime Minister to say, for example, what Dan Andrews is doing is not good enough would have a huge impact. And we were talking just before we came on air, Nick, about how Dominic Perrottet, as New South Wales Premier, has no constitutional authority over Queensland and Victoria, but he, he's led the debate. And we, I think all of us have tended to rely too much on on uh on laws and what's being written and we have to go back to, to Burke, to Montesquieu and, and to others and to understand the role of custom and convention and reignite that because well, otherwise we're going to lose and we are losing. A note of perhaps optimism. Sometimes it takes really, really bad government to produce good results in the long run. Without King John, we wouldn't have had Magna Carta. Mm. And without the Holocaust, Germany wouldn't have had the best constitution that it ever had with the basic law. So sometimes when the abuses of power get so big that ordinary people realize we can't let that happen again. I mean, same with the U.S. Constitution, of course, a similar kind of response to bad government. So if people realize now that what we've gone through in the last 18 months is abysmally bad government and we can't have that and we can't allow that in the future, perhaps we'll have a counter movement where people say, actually, no, we've now seen how this works and we never want to have that again. We could see something like that, actually, in the result of the German election on a different level. So people always thought that young people would predominantly wait, vote for the Greens, you know, Fridays for Future Generation, that kind of stuff. Actually, what happened was in the German election this year, the young voters, the largest proportion of young voters went for the free market, free Democrats. And I think this is a response to COVID because actually they have now for the first time in their lives experienced what it means not to be free. Because they couldn't go to school, they couldn't do their overseas experience, they couldn't go to university, their lives were disrupted and they have for the first time realized what an important thing freedom is and they went to the Free Democrats, so the classical Liberal Party. So I think the longer this goes on and the more the abuses of power and the restrictions of freedom become visible, we might actually see a classical Liberal backlash against them. Well, and, and Oliver, just to pick up, Nick, if I may, on Oliver's comment, here in Victoria, where we've had the strongest reaction um, against lockdowns and we have had outrageous police tactics uh, attempting to manage some of the protests. Um, so many of the protesters are under 30. They're covered in tattoos. Uh, they are people who work for themselves, who work for their with their hands. Um, there is an entire class of people who have been disenfranchised by the political process, who see the only way out um, to to be to protest. Um, and I hope that uh, I that Oliver is right, and that young people will begin to understand what happened because the middle aged middle class will not admit to themselves they have been misled and they were complicit in this massive mismanagement. I, I, I think and I'm, I think they still are. I'm not going to come to a firm conclusion on this because, you know, social transitions, social, you know, huge social, social transitions of the kind I think we're facing at the moment in result of COVID are very hard to analyse at the time. So, but it does seem to me we have, we've moved into a very, very different kind of world here. And here's the example based on what you say, John, about the protests in Melbourne at the weekend. Uh, there were quite large protests in, in, um, in Melbourne. And I watched, you know, as, as we all do now, we watch, we watch these on YouTube because they're not being covered or being covered only very uh, scathingly and slightly on the mainstream yep. media, which Correct. is incredible in itself. So we're going to a sort of underground network, if you like, news network to find out what's actually... Mm, exactly. Exactly. And, and Sam is uh, that. I watched a former poli senior police constable who's now resigned from the police force uh, speaking very passionately to this crowd uh, and saying, urging police officers on the fringe of this demonstration to, to basically ham hand in their badges, saying, We are not going, we, we do not do this job to enforce the uh, diktats. Of, of, a, of a premier, that's not what we're here for. He said that you guys, you didn't come to work to do this, you feel just as uncomfortable as I. This is incredible, right, to see. It. But none of that's been covered in a the media, senior has it? In the mainstream media, all of that has been his badge in disgust and then standing up at a public rally and urging other policemen to do the same. I mean, you might think, you know, 
Warsaw circa 1988, you know, or but but not Melbourne 2021. But that is happening, right? There is a public backlash. But we're in a very different world now. And, and what we're doing here, I mean, you guys, like here at the Menzies Research Centre, we've seen a, a big growth in people engaging in what we're doing now, you know, YouTube or podcasts. Uh, we, are we now moving then to a, a whole new brave world where, uh, you know, the mainstream media and, uh, you know, the political debate is, 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 is no longer synonymous that, that there's a whole lot more going on? And what does that do for trust? If we can't trust the mainstream media now, uh, if we can't trust public health officials because, you know, they've stuffed it up and won't admit it, um, where are we at? <laughs> John, good question. big questions. But with the... No, uh, just, just a, a, oh, look, a quick I'll, observation on public Oliver health officials. We only just found out today in New Zealand that our CEO of the Ministry of Health, the Director General of Health, attended 17 cabinet meetings this year. So I think it was every second or third cabinet meeting was attended by a public servant. That shouldn't happen. Cabinet is a political institution. To have a public servant actually become a politician effectively and sitting with ministers is unheard of in the Westminster system. That should never have happened, but it's a sign of our times. This is what's happening. It's politicization, maybe the corruption of the public sector. It should not happen that way. Look, I, it, and Nick, um, in, in relation to the media that we've spoken about a lot and I think we should speak about, it's funny you should mention I just sent in um, my uh, weekly email to IPA members um, a discussion about the media barracking for net zero in a completely different context to what we're talking about in, in, in Glasgow. But I, I think the public are realising that the media are now players. The media um, are not seeking to be objective or bipartisan or balance, they are barracking for a particular side. You mentioned um, the the ages treatment uh, of of people who dissent from the prevailing view of its readership. Um, we have very big challenges, and one of the things that I, I hope doesn't happen to Australia or New Zealand is the discussion that's now starting to occur in the US whether. Um, the, U the union and the US can even stay together because the, the difference in attitudes between populations, between media, between businesses is so great that they have little in common. And the media and civil institutions uh, in Australia and New Zealand were things that brought us together. But in that, now they're dividing us. Um, they are not being bipartisan. They're not engaged in a debate around the public square and space. Um, and they're picking uh, sides. I want to get on to is not Zero, good for our poverty. Blah blah blah. <laughs> Greta Thunberg put it later, John. But I, I think um, you know this politicisation of almost everything. Um, Oliver, I think you've got some thoughts on that as regards central banking. I do, and actually that leads us uh, straight into climate change as well. Last year, uh, last week, actually, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand uh, issued <laughs> a document to coincide with COP26. It's called Climate Changed, and it lays out the Reserve Bank's policies on climate change. Now you would kind of think, well, what does the Reserve Bank have to do with climate change? It's not within its mandate. And actually, at 4.9% consumer price inflation in New Zealand, you might think they've got some other things to worry about. Yeah. But this is our Reserve Bank, and the document was weird for a number of reasons. First of all, it tells us that central banks have something to do with climate change because they say, well, there will be stranded assets in the future. There might be... Um, insurance risk. Well, there, there's a difference between some risk and some costs. I mean, some businesses always change. I mean, the horse-drawn carriage disappeared and central banks didn't do much about it, right? So it's going to be the same with climate change. So actually, businesses are very good at adapting to changing circumstances. They don't need the central bank to actually think this for them. The other thing is it talked about its own emissions. Well, problem actually maybe this is news to the reserve bank we have an emissions trading scheme with a cap in new zealand so whatever they do it is capped it is already regulated the funny thing about the document was it's a document of more than 40 pages about climate change policy presumably except it doesn't mention our emissions trading scheme once even though it's our primary tool for dealing with emissions in new zealand so it's absolutely ludicrous but it goes hand in hand with the central bank that has become bigger over the last three years, basically since we appointed uh, our current governor. 
this was a central bank that used to employ 250 people just three years ago. They've gone up to 411 today. And that is because they're going into every issue of policy, every area of policy, even those absolutely disconnected from what central banks typically do. So they're now giving us their thoughts on climate change. They're giving us their thoughts on indigenous development, on the Maori economy. I mean, all very worthwhile topics, just not for a central bank. And I'm afraid we're seeing more of that worldwide. You see definitely a lot of that with the European Central Bank. And I'm just alarmed. We had the resignation of the German Bundesbank president, Jens Weidmann, just last week announcing by the end of the year he'll leave his position. He was portrayed as the most hawkish governor on the ECB Council, but he was also the one actually most clearly sticking to the treaties and actually reminding his fellow central bankers that what central banks are for is price stability and financial stability and none of the other nonsense that central banks occupy themselves with these days. So I'm really concerned about the future of central banking because the way I see it, we're going into a world in which central bankers are trying to take on more and more roles for themselves in which they are completely overreaching, in which they're completely forgetting what their primary target should be, namely stability. And in that sense, we are creating a massive democratic deficit on the side of central banks. And unfortunately, we're also ending up with a future in which higher inflation rates will become the norm. And, and Oliver, I would add to that, we've had uh, central bankers who have presided yeah. over a massive transfer Indeed. of wealth to asset holders as yep. they have engaged in an interest rate policy that is completely misguided. And if we were looking for silver linings to this, I'm going to go extreme and say oh, maybe we have to, begin to have now. a discussion yeah. about fiat uh, currency. Actually, but that's for another day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we, but we need to talk about did you these say things percent that we haven't been. 4.9% in New Zealand. Um, for the Eurozone, it looks very similar. They're also expecting around 5% at the end of the year, probably even higher in early 2022. No, we have to talk about this. We have to talk about this also in the context of the next global financial crisis, which is, I think, a matter of when, not if. And it could come sooner than we all think. Well, let's just follow this through. And You're an economist, uh, Oliver, and, and John and I have followed these various financial crises over the years. So where we're at now is 5% plus inflation in the US around that in the, you know, Australia's a bit of an outlier. We're still only about three point something, but, but uh, I tell you what, you wouldn't bank on it staying there forever. Meanwhile, interest rates are, you know, I still just remortgaged my place for about 2.6%, I think, uh, last week. <laughs> Nobody seems to be prepared for inflation, what that's going to do to uh, livelihoods, to assets, to the savings of people for retirement, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and what it's going to do for um, for debt, for household debt, and, and where does that leave? Um, government, debt, government indeed, debt, indeed, indeed. Let's not so forget that, John. <laughs> We at the uh, New Zealand Initiative, we are about to launch a report this week on the next financial crisis. We'll launch it, if you're interested, in a webinar with our former Prime Minister, John Key. And um, we are documenting, actually, the deteriorating state of public and private finances in the world. It's not a, an isolated phenomenon happening just in one country. It's actually simultaneous across the world. Look at the Bank of England. The Bank of England is the world's oldest central bank. It has uh, records going back to the late 17th century. Well, interest rates have never been as low as they are today, and the Bank of England never had a portfolio assets on its balance sheet as high as today because they took on all the stuff in the context of um, unorthodox monetary policy. And that's the development that we see reflected in basically every other country. You can see the same balance sheet development for the ECB, for the Fed, for the RBNZ, for the RBA, for the Bank of Japan, for the Bank of China. It's happening everywhere. The, one of the causes, really, of the global financial crisis about a decade ago was, of course, debt. Well, and then we talked about deleveraging, meaning we would like to reduce debt. You look at debt today, and it is much higher than it used to be a decade ago. We've got countries like Italy, where debt has actually shot up by 50, 60 percent of GDP since then. The problem is that these countries are no longer able to live with normal interest rates. So interest rates in the Eurozone, given the state of um, inflation where it is right now, they should probably be somewhere around 4 or 5%. In fact, they're zero, actually slightly below that. 
But on more normal interest rates, of course, Italy would be bankrupt. I mean, the Italian government's indebted to the tune of about 155% of GDP. If they paid proper interest rates again, like the interest rates of about 6-7% on 10-year bonds that they paid before the GFC, you could wreck Italy overnight and with it, its banking system. And that's the catch-22 for central banks. They cannot allow the world to go back to normal. The moment the world goes back to normal, whole countries and banking systems are bankrupt. And that's why they keep it going. The problem is the longer they keep it going, the bigger the crash will be eventually, because at some stage we'll have to correct this. So what we say in our report as a recommendation to policymakers here, but I think it equally applies to Australia, we have to fix our roof while the sun is still more or less shining. That means we have to get public finances in order. You do not want to have the fiscal contraction happening when monetary policy goes back to normal. You have to have this earlier because you have to prepare. And the other thing, and that leads us to John's point about fiat currency, well, it's time to think about what should be our reserves. Should we diversify out of the US dollar, which is just another fiat currency? Should we perhaps reconsider the role of gold, which I think would might, might be a good idea? Should central banks maybe hold some of their reserves in Bitcoin? Why not? Mm. I think we need to get out of this. We need to get out of this fiat money system, which has actually wrecked us, has, has wrecked public finances, has given politicians way too much money to play with. And I think the upcoming financial crisis will make the 2000 eight, nine, ten crisis look like a walk in the park. Did we, did we, question for both of you before we move on to Glasgow uh, and COP26, did, 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 did we just fundamentally stuff up fiscal management during COVID by uh, interest rates low to stimulate the economy, handing money out to stimulate the economy? In the end, the economy didn't really need any stimulating. And uh, in, in Australia, certainly, uh, uh, tell me if it's different in New Zealand, but that of the hundreds of billions uh, of dollars that we've invested into this from a government level, most of it has ended up going into private savings or paying off private debt. So we've reduced household debt, we've reduced private debt, we've increased government debt. Is that simplifying it or did we just get it completely wrong? Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Well, I don't know whether we got it completely wrong at the beginning, Nick. Yeah. I think uh, in Australia and New Zealand, measures like JobKeeper, people, keeping people connected to work was very important. The IPA supported those measures. But I think if we were to speak in broad terms, the first six months of, of most policy responses were appropriate. After that, we didn't know how to turn off the tap. And the situation in Australia was the federal government was funding state government to keep businesses shut. That was the problem. Um, and now from a country that had uh, net zero debt, uh, federally 10 years ago, um, we're approaching record levels and uh, the Australian Treasury says uh, we'll be looking totally at 40 agree. to 50% of Zealand, GDP the way, we also uh, these compensation for measures our because lifetimes. That's what they were. If the government locks you down, then they should at least uh, share some of the pain. So it was only right to keep workers connected to the workplaces. We were totally in support of that. But actually, we had a lot of needless economic pain. I mean, we always argue that um, even in the lockdown, you should be able to work if it's safe to do so. But we went totally overboard. We completely locked us down. Even when people could have worked, they were locked out. Uh, and then the government yes. had to compensate. And of course, COVID also gave government a lot of cover to do things that they wanted to do anyway, under the guise of actually stimulating the economy, as we now see that wasn't necessary. So we've also ended up with a massive increase in public debt, but we've also unfortunately seen a massive increase in house prices. In New Zealand, in the last 12 months, house prices have gone up about 30%. It is absolutely insane. If you look at the state of our property market in New Zealand, we have completely priced out a whole generation of young would-be homeowners out of the market because of the government's policies and the Reserve Bank's money printing. And a final point that I'd make, Nick, is, and I've certainly seen it here in Victoria, uh, with a state government having the worst debt situation of any government in Australia, 
Um, debt now no longer seems to matter in the public discourse. When I started in politics and public policy in the 80s, we had sophisticated conversations about the current account deficit, uh, about debt servicing ratios, about uh, public sector debt, household debt. All of that seems to have now gone out of the window. And for a centre-right opposition parties, it's very difficult to mount an economic campaign uh, against centre-left governments on the notion of we can't afford to continue living like we have because the centre-left government says, well, we will just keep on borrowing it. here Again, here in Victoria, we in the 1990s, we had big dis- discussions about borrowing to no. fund recurring well, uh, talking uh, about expenditure. Things about which well, we are again, not having a sophisticated none of that's conversation. None. <laughs> climate change. Uh, we're having plenty of conversations about climate change, but they seem to be to be mostly <laughs> very simplistic and, and dumbed down. Um, come on, John, you, 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 you lead us in. We, frame mm. this discussion on Glasgow for us and then we'll, we'll go ahead. Oh, Nick, how can I? How, where do I begin? How do I frame a discussion about Australia following the path of uh, Macron, Boris Johnson and Joe Biden? Um, I think, again, we have seen a disconnect between uh, the reality of Australia's emissions, the successes we've had since uh, 2005 in reducing our emissions, uh, the feasibility uh, of further reductions... Uh, and we have seen a media campaign and we've seen barracking and we've seen the rhetoric of net zero without any discussion about the about the costs, about the consequences. I've written about this and um, for all of Boris Johnson's yeah. failures in this regard, I think the UK government has actually engaged in a more sophisticated discussion about the costs of well, so, the transition um, are, in a way a very, uh, that I don't uh, think we've begun you to have a Prime Minister who's enormously concerned about climate change, he tells us, and yet New Zealand's record since 2005 is not great. I think you've reduced your emissions by less than 1% since 2005. Uh, Australia's reduced its budget a little over 20. But uh, the problem for you is that the Prime, the Prime Minister is committed to getting to a 30% reduction by 20 uh, you've got to, the All Blacks have got it all to play for in the second half, haven't they? <laughs> How are you going to get from from where you are now to thirty percent without wrecking your economy? Okay, to put some nuance into the debate, um, yes, we've had uh, practically no reduction in the last twenty years of New Zealand's emissions, but that was at a time when New Zealand didn't have a cap in the cap and trade system. So we had an emissions trading system without a cap. Well, of course, that doesn't work, but. Since last June, we have a cap, and the cap is a sinking lid. It will go down to net zero by 2050, so we are on a track towards reducing emissions. In the last year, our emission certificates, so the price you have to pay for burning uh, fossil fuels for a ton of carbon dioxide, they have shot up. They're currently around 65 New Zealand dollars per ton. They used to be just 20 about a year ago. So actually, we are on a path now towards reducing our emissions because our companies in New Zealand are responding to that. Our members at the New Zealand Initiative are some of New Zealand's largest companies, and I talk to the CEOs all the time, and what they tell me is actually that this carbon price really has a dramatic impact on their operations. Even the CEO of a gas company recently told me that they are electrifying because at $65 it's no longer economical to use gas. So this is happening. Um, I've got no problem with that because it's a market-based mechanism. It's um, actually relying on dispersed information to drive emissions down, and that's working if really efficiently. Where I have a problem is actually with our government doing all sorts of things on top of the ETS, having absolutely no effect, got coming at a massive price tag. Because once you have decided to go for an ETS, basically every economist will tell you, every international agency will tell you that that's your choice. You cannot combine an ETS with a cap logically with subsidies or carbon taxes or regulations. We know that. We've known that for more than two decades now. And even the IPCC in one of the big reports said, actually, policy-wise, you've got a choice to make, but you can't combine the two. Unfortunately, that's what our government does. And one final word on COP. It was opened yesterday, of course, by a climate change activist from New Zealand. Not sure whether you've seen the story, but actually this is a young New Zealand version of Greta Thunberg, basically, a young Maori activist going to Glasgow to say, well, actually, climate change 
is uh, basically the result of colonialism and racism and uh, colonial settlement and uh, capitalism. That is the stuff that frightens me even more because we now see this climate change is becoming a vehicle for all sorts of other policies. As I said, we have an emissions trading scheme. This is a sophisticated way, an economic way of dealing with a problem. Now that we got it, we should actually sit back, relax and let the system work. But the fact that we are now seeing all sorts of other agendas tagged on to climate change, what does it tell you? It basically tells you it has nothing to do with the climate. This is what worries me. And enough, and enough is never enough is never enough. So no sooner does Scott Morrison commit in Australia to net zero by 2050, then people say, well, that's not enough, and uh, he has to uh, pursue tougher 2030 yeah, targets. That's right. And um, this is what the success of the so movement the, the uh, leading to Glasgow is to say that enough is never this. enough. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, we all, we're all familiar with Bjorn Lomborg's. Uh, approach to this and I think we'd all instinctively say that's the correct one which is where you you look and you say well yes okay let there we, we see a we see that the planet is warming we can see that human emissions may maybe one of the reasons for that what can we do what can we rationally do what within the resources we have as as not as a government but as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, as nations because uh, what can we reasonably dedicate to that problem or could we put it to solving some other problem and have more effect on human happiness? I mean, that's right. Correct. But, but Nick, for Bjorn Lomborg saying that some years ago, he was uh, cancelled by Australian universities, the University of Western Australia, uh, didn't want to have anything to do with Bjorn Lomborg simply for him saying we have to understand the of that is going um, to be bad what is policy, the opportunity right? cost of the things we're doing. No and for that he was labelled a denier the and not accepted the anointed, the as Tom and Sol, Sol put it, yeah, or nothing. Yeah. Uh, well, I can give you a practical example of that, Nick. Just look at New Zealand. Our government has introduced a so-called youth tax. So you get a, well, it's a fee bait scheme, they also call it like that. So basically, if you buy an electric vehicle, you now get uh, up to $8,000 from the government. If you buy an imported petrol car, you pay a penalty. And so the government actually is trying to tell us that the penalty will pay for the subsidy. Of course, the penalty, well, they will raise a lot more in penalties than they'll pay in subsidies because there are not that many electric vehicles in New Zealand. But the great irony of all of that is that it doesn't save a single gram of carbon dioxide. Why not? Because we've got an emissions trading scheme. We've got a cap. So for every gram of carbon dioxide saved by a new electric vehicle, somebody else will just have to pay less for their emissions. So it's great news if you drive a V8 because your petrol bill will go down. But actually, it's a complete waste of public money and of people's money. So we're getting all sorts of nonsensical policies that really show you it's not about the climate, it's about making politicians look good. So you're, you're saying that if, if you know, you as a, as a driver of a Ford, five-litre Ford Mustang, it's in your I interest... I would a five-litre Ford Mustang, I'm a Mercedes fan. <laughs> of course, but it's in your interest to see lots of people drive around in Nissan Leafs. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I mean, the thing is actually... If we are subsidizing electric vehicles, all it will do under the logic of an emissions trading scheme with a binding cap is it will drive down the emissions price. The certificates will cost less and motorists in New Zealand have to purchase these certificates at the pump. So the petrol companies actually pay for these certificates. You cannot drive a car in New Zealand without actually also paying for certificates. So if I subsidize all sorts of other technologies, if I subsidize electric vehicles, if I replace coal boilers in schools with different technologies, all I do is I reduce the emission certificate price and that means that motorists driving petrol vehicles will pay less. Well, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You don't change the emissions by a single gram of carbon dioxide, but you do this at an enormous cost to the taxpayer. Well, I guess we should come close to wrapping this up. Uh, look, I, always, I always feel obliged to say we should end on a redemptive note. <laughs> I'll try. John, you start. <laughs> um, I, look, I'd come back to something that we touched on, which is um, young people particularly beginning to understand the, the consequences of what's occurring. 
Um, we touched on some of the political consequences of COVID. I think the economic uh, consequences of COVID uh, will take yeah. decades to play out. And I was reading, Nick, um, uh, just overnight, a wonderful piece by a friend of yours and ours, Joel Kotkin, on Spiked, um, talking about uh, how Main Street uh, across the English-speaking world um, has been destroyed by lockdowns, how bigger businesses uh, have taken an ever bigger role in the economy, um, how the impact on uh, small businesses and businesses owned by minority groups um, has been very great indeed. Um, and I think um, our challenge is to explain that what is happening is the result of deliberate decisions by the government. How we respond to COVID, how we respond to inflation, how we respond right, to climate well, change, none me. of that is from predetermined. There are decisions and we have well, to communicate. I mean, um, this optimism, of course, comes decisions. naturally to me as a German. So um, the most optimistic thing I can say is that I think politics will now drive towards reopening, whether they like it or not. Our prime minister is probably just as much a control freak as Dan Andrews. But as we can see on TV that Europe is going back to normal, that the football stadia are full again once again in Europe, that Germany is having Christmas markets again this year. We can all see this on television. I think this will drive our government towards reopening, whether they like it or not. So the border will open. We'll probably get what Australia already got this week, namely international travel again. And that's my piece of optimism. I would like to see you guys again. I haven't been to Australia for a couple of years, and I miss you, and I miss Australia, and I hope that in 2022 we can actually physically come together rather than having just these Zoom calls, which, frankly, I'm getting a bit sick of. Here, here. And look, my piece of optimism comes from uh, Philip Roth's novel, The Plot Against America. You're probably familiar with it. It's a sort of counterfactual in which uh, a, uh, a fascist uh, 